Thank you, Ross. What a great venue. What a great conference. What's next? That's something we at NASA think about a lot. We think about it all the time, especially in the last couple years with the end of the space shuttle program. What's next? What's our next great ship for exploration? But before we talk about the future, it's instructive to go back and look at our past. What were the exploration ships of our past? I grew up on the Gulf Coast, and down there we regularly stand on the end of land and look out at the horizon, and it beckons. What's out there? The street I grew up on was called Pirate's Lane. The town I grew up in was called Spanish Fort. It's in our blood. I have a cousin, he's a charter fisherman. He daily goes out and loses sight of, of, of shore. He goes out 36 miles. I have another cousin who sailed around the world, including an Atlantic solo crossing. So what's next? Well, we think about the past. When you think about ships, you probably think of something like this. I'm guessing like this. Sails taut in the wind, timbers creaking. Those dead trees, the only thing between the sailors and almost certain death. Going out into the unknown. And if you're going to go out into the unknown, how do you want to design that ship? You want it to be robust and capable. See, histori historically, ships of exploration came from other industries, merchant ships, military ships, some were even prison ships. These were very capable vehicles and were capable of going to lots of different locations to do their job. One of my favorite explorers is Captain James Cook, and it's no coincidence that he shares the name of the captain of the Starship Enterprise. Thanks to Gene Roddenberry for that one. Captain Cook did three Pacific crossings from 1768 until his untimely death in 1779. It's also no coincidence that two of his ships, the Endeavour and Discovery, share the names of our space shuttles. You see where I'm going? So, he was a great explorer. One of his ships, the Resolution, he sailed to Hawaii. He became the first European to go there. But that same ship he took down to the Antarctic Circle. He nearly discovered Antarctica, except they ran out of supplies and had to come home. One ship to go into two of the most diverse environments on the planet. That's a very capable ship. On his first voyage, he went to Tahiti. And the reason he went to Tahiti is because he was chartered by the British Royal Society. And the astronomers there knew that if you could, you could, you could observe the, the Venus transit across the sun from two very different locations on the planet, you could more accurately calculate the distance from the earth to the sun. This is exploration for the sake of science. He also sailed to Australia. And he had on the boat with him a man, a botanist, Joseph Banks, a scientist. And when he got there, he found a bay. And it was so rich with diverse flora and fauna, fauna, they named it what is now known as Botany Bay. That's exploration benefiting science. But their partnership went further than that. In his day, there was a, there was a disease. It was called the scourge of the seas. It was scurvy. Most explorers never came home alive. But because he had Joseph Banks with him, he, taught, he, and, he and Captain Cook partnered, and he taught him how to eat native plants. And not one of his explorers that went with him died on their journeys. That's science for the sake of exploration. You see, science and exploration go together to change the world expand commerce, and change the way we live. Fast forward to present day. This is a map of over 16,000 ships in one year that have sailed the ocean seas. If you look, 
the red lines represent between 100 and 200 expeditions. The yellow bright lines represent over 5,000. Cook, Magellan, Columbus, Drake, and the others, they paved the way. And that's revolutionized the way our commerce works today. We've mapped this ocean. So if this is our ocean today, what's next? In 1962, John Glenn became the first American to orbit the Earth. Nearly a year earlier, John F. Kennedy announced a program to send a human to the moon and bring him home safely. And when he did, he talked about the new ocean of space. He said, space is the new ocean, and America must sail on it and be second to none. Well, if we're going to sail on this ocean, what do the islands look like? What are the distant shores? What are the continents? In the bottom left, you see Earth. Only 200 plus miles above the surface is the International Space Station. It's been permanently crewed for a number of years. But at the scale of this picture, it's not even a pixel above the surface of the Earth. Three orders of magnitude further out, the moon. We've been there, but with 1960s technology and 1960s t capabilities, imagine what it would be like if we could go there today. Just beyond the moon, Lagrange points. You see the space station, it orbits the Earth, but it's still trapped in Earth's gravity. It has to continually reboost. If it doesn't, it'll fall into the ocean. And someday it will. But at a Lagrange point, you could put a space station there that's in a stable orbit indefinitely. That's a waypoint to future destinations out into the solar system. Another order of magnitude, asteroids. Why do we care about asteroids? Well, because of what happened in Russia about a month ago. <laughs> the equivalent of 30 Hiroshima bombs exploding 20 kilometers above our atmosphere. Weapons of mass destruction exist and they're in space. And if we don't do something about it, the asteroids have already won. <laughs> Another order of magnitude, Mars. It's been the dream destination for humans for a generation. But Mars is hard. To get to Mars, you have to be able to get a habitat and supplies for crew for long durations and radiation protection and a descent vehicle and the ability to move around on the surface and a habitation module and a module to be able to get you back home and then re-enter safely. That's a lot of stuff. And in order to do that, you're gonna need a large capability. When Neil Armstrong walked on the moon, he said, this is one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. Mars is the next giant leap. So if these are the new islands, what's next? What's next is our next great ship. I'd like to show it to you. This is the Space Launch System. When built, it'll be nearly two stories taller than the Statue of Liberty. Its engines so powerful that when they fire for the eight minutes of launch, they put out more energy than 18 Hoover dams. Even in the initial configuration, this vehicle can put 140,000 pounds into space or more. It's a very capable ship. It'll launch in 2017 from Kennedy Space Center. We're taking hum a human rated capsule around the backside of the moon. From there, we're going to double its capacity, 130 metric tons to space. This ship will be very capable and robust and we'll be able to go to all of these islands. So where will we go? What's next? I mentioned the International Space Station. It's nearly the volume equivalent of a 4,000 square foot house. But it took 25 space, station, space shuttle missions to get it into space, plus four Russian launches. We have a friend that's in the destination business. 
Mr. Robert Bigelow. He built hotels. Well, now he wants to build hotels in space, and he's actually put two prototypes up there already. We have an agreement to put another version on the International Space Station. This version, his next design, is the equivalent of a 9,000 square foot house. Our studies show that we can launch this with one launch of the space launch system. It's a very capable ship. So where else? To the asteroids, of course. With current rocket technology, it takes years to get to an asteroid. With the space launch system, you can get there in weeks. And if you can get there in weeks, and you can take humans there, you can do planetary defense. So after that, Mars, again, the dream destination. This picture was painted by a friend of mine, Dr. Dan Durda, Southwest Research Institute. He's a planetary geologist, and someday he wants to walk on the surface of Mars and do his geology work. Remember Joseph Banks? I'd like to build the ship that gets him there. But Mars is hard. Let's show, I'm going to show you a video here of now of what it's going to look like when we go. Four, three, two, one, and lift off. That's what it's going to look like. When Kennedy uh, announced his moon mission speech, shortly thereafter, he went to Rice University, and he gave a very famous speech there. And in that speech, he paid homage to uh, George Mallory, who was the first human to ever conquer Everest. And ultimately, he died there. He remarked that when Mallory was asked, why did you go? He said, because it's there. And then Kennedy went on to say, well... Space is there, and we intend to, to, to climb it. And the moon and the planets are there. And new hope of prosperity and peace are there. And as we embark on this most dangerous and hazardous and exciting adventure in the history of humankind, we ask God's blessing. Well, those islands I showed you are there, and we intend to go there. We intend to build the ship that will take you there. We hope you'll join us for the journey. Thank you.